Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi, an activist and cause marketer. And two of my ideals are sustainability and minimalism. Today, we get to dive into each of these topics with an expert podcaster and author. Before I introduce them, I have some news. We are now active on Clubhouse. You can join weekly discussions on social impact and sustainability in an open forum that's inclusive each Wednesday evening. Find us on Clubhouse at Care More Be Better. Just leave out that last R, I'm sorry, that last E in better. So again, that's find us on Clubhouse at Care More Be Better. Just leave out that final E in better. If you like what we're doing, you can support the show by sharing it with your friends and keep it ad free by donating directly on our site. Just visit caremorebebetter.com and click donate. Now today I'm thrilled to be joined by a fellow podcaster, and sustainable minimalist, Stephanie Safarian. Stephanie is an expert in sustainability, zero waste and minimalism. Through her blog, Mama Minimalist and her podcast, Sustainable Minimalists, she offers simple strategies to reduce clutter and live more intentionally in an effort to save our planet. Now in January of this year, 2021, she released her first book, Sustainable Minimalism which I had the pleasure of reading or rather listening to on Audible as I prepared for today's interview. In this book, Stephanie shares the stark reality of our global waste epidemic while offering tips on how to reduce waste while adopting a lifestyle that holds sustainability and minimalism as central tenants of the household. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Hi, Corinna. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. You know, I would love to you. Um, I would love for you to kick us off by sharing with our audience how you advise those new to minimalism and new to sustainability, so that they can begin making small changes in their daily lives. I am a huge advocate for incrementalism. So that means you start where you're at and you take a little tiny baby, not even a step, a toe forward towards a decluttered and a more eco-friendly life. You take the smallest little toe forward possible. So what's one thing that you could reasonably try on for size? Maybe you hang up your next load of laundry instead of using the dryer, if that's what you normally do. Maybe you make your coffee at home tomorrow instead of head to by me, we have Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is one really small change that is not going to uh, stress you out uh, mm -hmm. that you can reasonably consider doing for the long haul? That's where I suggest everybody starts. Don't do all the things all at once. That's a recipe for disaster. Just do one thing at a time. You know, I think there's also an instance where someone gets super passionate about recycling and they become almost a pain to everybody else in their circles by, um, I don't know, saying like, well, you put that in the trash, you know, how dare you type of thing. So one of the things that we discussed in an earlier podcast with Eliza Erskine, who helps companies become B Corps, was that there can be that kind of fatigue around something like recycling. So how would you advise somebody who, let's say, has gone to the militant space to kind of help somebody along the way without making them feel like they're being um, judged for the recycling measures that they take already? So I do believe that sometimes it's better to say nothing than to say something, because if the approach isn't welcome, or if, if the if the offer to help is not welcome, and if the approach is judgy, it's going to do more harm than good. So I suggest for anybody who feels a little bit militant in their eco-friendliness mm -hmm. to consider the consider your audience. So are you talking to somebody who would be receptive to learning about how to better recycle or not? Uh, first, consider your audience and decide whether your advice is going to fall on dead ears or whether it's actually going to make a difference. I resonate with that. And one of the things that um, I have been frustrated with is the fact that so many of the goods that we buy in the grocery store come packaged in plastic. And when I looked into my local recyclers, um, well, you know, all of these items that are packaged in plastic bear this nice little recycling seal, right? 
And yet I found out that most of them were not actually being recycled by my local um, waste facility management. So what that ultimately means is that even though I had been putting those items into the recycle bin, they essentially weren't being recycled. I thought I was doing good. I was actually just mucking up their system. So that's something that you cover in the book. <clears throat> what would you say to the person who, who has been recycling, had the best intentions over the course of the last few years, and finds out that perhaps they their efforts are going unmet by the matching needs of that waste facility? Yeah, I talk about recycling extensively in the book precisely because when I realized the true state of recycling in the United States, I was horrified. <laughs> uh, we are taught to believe that recycling is this amazing <laughs> innovation where our plastics and glass and aluminum and cardboard get magically uh, re-upcycled, upcycled, I guess would be a better word, into a new product. But the reality is, and without going into all the changes in Chinese imports in the past three years, I would say that a lot of what you and I and your listeners are diligently recycling does not get recycled. Recycling is expensive in the United States and it's, it's expensive for the trash companies. And so it is more common than you would think for such companies, such municipalities to cut corners by simply recycling none of it and sending it all to the landfill. So mm -hmm. for listeners who uh, are similarly horrified <laughs> by yeah. that, my suggestion would be to consider no longer looking at recycling as this amazing innovation because it's it's not. Um, if you're concerned about waste, uh, I would consider, or I would urge your listeners to consider um, taking home less recycling to begin with. That's a big part of my book because I'm so passionate about it. The answer in my opinion is not recycling. So if we look at the bins that we fill up each week, as all garbage, then perhaps we can move ourselves in the direction of change. I mean, because what I think about, you know, if you're drinking these bottles of wine, enjoying your evening at home, um, that bottle of wine is made of glass. That glass costs money to make. It's thankfully inert. And so far as the environment is concerned, if it ends up in landfill, but at the same time, you know, it takes energy to build and to recycle anew. Often too, I found out that recyclers in my neighborhood, at least, if the glass bottles break um, on their way from the bin into the garbage um, truck, that those broken glasses or those broken bottles do not get recycled. And so it's a really complicated story that I think we just need to get a little bit more clear on. If we start to look at everything that leaves our house as waste in those garbage bins, I think that would be helpful. No. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to say too that um, we've been taught by <laughs> recycling marketers that be, if we recycle, we're strong environmental stewards. We're doing right. We're doing all we can. But I would urge anybody listening today to think instead not of recycling if you recycle as you being an environmental steward, think of instead, how can, how can you reduce your waste and reducing waste also therefore means reducing how much you're quote unquote recycling mm -hmm. and how much you're consuming. Yes. So as I read your book, it became obvious to me that you're asking people to want more out of life and less stuff cluttering it, which could be the things that might end up in your recycling bin, but it could also be just the items that you're bringing into your home. So can you tell us more about your journey from more of that consumerism perspective to a minimalist perspective? I'd love to. <laughs> so I should start by saying I was never particularly eco-friendly. I didn't grow up in a eco-friendly minimalist house by any means. I never thought about plastics. I never thought about our society's reliance on overconsumption. Um, 
I never, it never crossed my mind until I became a mother. I, my husband and I, and my dog and our two cats, we were living in an 850 square foot apartment when my first daughter was born. And very soon after she was born, I felt suffocated by all her stuff. It felt like it was squeezing us out of our apartment. Uh, mm -hmm. the, all, all the clothes, so many clothes. I, if I said she had a hundred dresses, I don't even think that would be an exaggeration. The toys, the gear, uh, and I didn't have much free time, to, but the free time I had was spent cleaning, organizing, putting away, maintaining all this excess. And so I had a moment where I just said, you know, let's work smarter, not harder. Let's get rid of everything that's non-essential. Uh, you don't need a hundred frilly dresses, daughter. <laughs> you, you wear one zip up onesie, <laughs> maybe two if we have an accident every day, the frilly dresses, like it's just excess. But when I went to go to figure out, you know, what to do with all this stuff, I was met with more questions. Uh, minimalism at this point, this was around 2015. Minimalism was a buzzword. Everybody's like jumping on the minimalist ba bandwagon, but all the minimalist influencers, nobody was talking about, well, what to do with all this stuff that doesn't spark joy. Uh, you know, they say, get rid of it, but you know, out of sight, go? yeah, out of sight, out of mind. No. And it, that didn't work for me. The thought of sending all this perfectly good stuff to the landfill just, just wasn't, <laughs> wasn't going to happen in my little apartment. And so at the time I wanted to minimize in an eco-friendly way and I couldn't find resources. I couldn't find a person talking about that. So I decided I was going to be that person. And I started a blog to categorize my successes, my failures to hopefully help others. And here we are five-ish years later. Um, I've got a podcast and a book and uh, I'm still <laughs> talking about sustainable minimalism until my head hurts. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think um, there's this trend in sustainability too, where people don't want to get rid of things before their useful life has ended. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, having grown up in a household that did cherish sustainability, that looked at life cycle of goods, I, you know, learned when I learned um, listening to another podcast that you were on talking about how many times an item of clothing gets worn before it ends up at Goodwill or some other charity was really surprising to me. I think um, the average was about four times. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think every piece of clothing that I own has been worn probably a hundred mm -hmm. um, because I think about that and I, you know, I will wear them to the point where there's a hole in it and it's not repairable. So I need to consider this a rag and cut it up. But there is this sense within that sustainability kind of core to me that, that it has a very hard time being minimalist because I hold on to these things until their useful life is, let's say, dissipated because I fear too much that it will just end up in landfill, even if I do donate it, right? Mm -hmm. There's this entire trend from um, the fast fashion world where all these, these cheap clothing items get made they get donated and they don't actually find a new home once they're donated. So they just end up in garbage. So what would you have to say to the person concerned about that or who might be having a hard time transitioning from this rooted, sustainable, perhaps almost pack rat perspective. And I'm, I'm uh, looking in the mirror as I say this um, to something more minimalist. Well, first I would say that you know, eco-friendly living and minimalist living, they don't have to be on opposite sides of the spectrum, right? You can fall somewhere in the middle. You can be slightly more of a pack rat and, and still want to live with less. Uh, and to your question about wanting to keep everything um, so that it doesn't head to the landfill, I would say, I, I guess I would ask you, is keeping all this stuff uh, impeding your quality of life? And if the answer is no, then go on with your bad self and keep it. <laughs> but if it is, which for a lot of people, the excess uh, contributes to stress and anxiety, contributes to resentment with 
his or her partner contributes to loss of free time, organizing, maintaining all this stuff. And so if that sounds like your experience, I would say, consider utility, consider the item in question's utility. Can you actually pass, if it has utility, like if you have a shirt that you're not wearing, but doesn't have holes, um, can you find somebody in your life, not Goodwill, not Salvation Army, those gray <laughs> Salvation Army, excuse me, those like, instead of just dumping it somewhere, do you have an actual person in your life who you know would benefit from this item? Mm -hmm. I feel like when we take our stuff and put it in a box and like leave it outside a donation center, we're removed from the act of donating. And so if you can give it to a person and know that they will receive benefit and actually use the item, that might, um, might, um, relieve some of the worry that you have about sending mm -hmm. something straight to the landfill. Well, that transitions really nicely to this other topic that you cover in the book about trading, giving, and gifting. So let's talk about what each of these looks like as we seek to help our listeners understand how they can reduce their footprint by seeking used and giving used products, even as gifts. Yeah. So I should say right off the bat that I grew up in a household that revered newness as a kid. You know, we didn't thrift, we bought new. And the stuff that we bought new was not quality stuff. It was fast fashion, but it was new. And there was definite, there was a definite prioritization of newness. And so even as I, as a podcaster and writer in this space, I'm always checking my assumptions about mm -hmm. thrifting because that goes against how I grew up. Um, and I, a lot of listeners who write to me say the same. They grew up with newness. The thought of spending money on something old uh, doesn't, doesn't really, <laughs> something just doesn't feel right about it. And so I would say that, you know, marketers, advertisers, advertising teams have told us all that new new is best but i would argue that new is not best if new is um eating up our planet's non-renewable resources and then trashing the planet <laughs> in the forms of pollution in our waterways and our oceans and overflowing our landfills so i suggest if you can thrift. If you have a thrift store, go for it. If you can buy secondhand from th Facebook marketplace, I say, go for it. If you have a buy nothing group, which is in my opinion, one of the most amazing things in the world, mm -hmm. you put, it's a great way to declutter stuff. You don't need, you no longer mm -hmm. need, but it's also a great way to acquire things you do need without spending a cent. And finally a buy nothing group, one other great aspect to them is they really strengthen bonds between community members. Yeah, I hope that answers your that. question. Yeah. You know, one of the things I've worked to do is reduce the plastic toy input. And as many times as I host a birthday party or something like that for our kids, we're always essentially saying no gifts and limiting party favors to things that can be reused or that are made of wood or that you know, aren't just the general plastic crap that you would get from the Dollar Tree, because I think that has become the norm for so many of these kids' birthday parties. And I know we've been for the last year in a bit of a pandemic, and there isn't as much of that. However, that has also introduced, I think, more disposability into our daily lives again, because even those of us who want to go grocery shopping with our own reusable bags are being told in many cases that we can't use those anymore. Or if we do use them at specific stores, they're saying, okay, well, you have to pack it yourself at the end, then you're cluttering up the line and, 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 you know? So I wondered if you could talk about perhaps how we can practically approach reducing our consumption of plastics right now, specifically during this pandemic. If you have any particular gems or ideas, I'd love to hear them. Well, this is something I struggle with, have been struggling with for the past year. I would say that we are living in extraordinary times 
uh, and not in a good way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we must therefore pivot our, our daily eco-friendly acts and we need to let ourselves off the hook as best we can with, mm -hmm. with regard to plastics. Um, you know, I'm at my supermarket, they are not allowing us to bring our own bag. So I have mm -hmm. a gigantic stack in my, in my garage of paper bags. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to reuse them one by one, but I probably have about 300 at this point. I would say for anybody struggling with that, like you are, like I am, I would say, try your best to shop at places other than the supermarket, mm -hmm. the, the supermarket, the pharmacy, they are, un they are under the assumption that um, reusables are unsanitary. There's no, there's no science to back that up, but can you go to a mom and pop store who, is more open to you bringing your bags. Can you go to the farmer's market and put your lettuce in directly into your bag? These are mm -hmm. all places that do not rely on the single use disposables nearly as much as the supermarket. And mm -hmm. so can we, can we lean in to those places now and always? Yeah. You know, I know that the local farmer's market in Santa Cruz, um, when they first reopened, um, it was very much like a hazmat shopping experience. <laughs> if I'm being frank, you know, you, you lined up and you could only walk in and certain staged, um, order. You didn't touch any of the produce yourself. They packaged everything in plastic and handed it over to you. Um, and now that's getting back to a place where you can, you know, more like bring your basket or something like that with you. So I think some of those restrictions are starting to loosen. And what I've noticed in my home area is that the Rayleigh's grocery stores are allowing you to bring your own bag in, but you have to pack it yourself. That hasn't um, actually been the case for many of the others. So what I've been doing, and this can work, I don't know if it's something that you're able to do given where you are shopping, but putting everything back into the cart and then just going to my car and putting them back and putting them into the reusable bags in my car, since some of those stores just still have restrictions, which makes sense to some extent, but which are, I think, they've just gone overboard. It's the pendulum swing, right? We fear, so we swing all the way to one direction. The science shows that contact um, transmission of COVID is lower. It's more like airborne that seems to be the problem. So wearing reusable masks is really good. You know, I'm <clears throat> just constantly um, struggling with one other point, And that is that I've always looked at um, coffee as a treat. And, um, so when I'm out and about every once in a while, I'm like, gosh, I could really, it'd be nice to get a coffee or a tea out at a local coffee shop. And I had traditionally just brought my reusable mug with me all of the time. And now they are not allowing me to do that. I'm looking forward to the day at which they will lift those restrictions, but even just for listeners who might have battled that same problem, um, what I can suggest is that you just ask them not to give you the plastic lid, because that is, I think the worst contributor that you get from, you know, that short visit to the coffee shop. So, um, something else you cover in the book specifically talks about some of the contaminants that are in the plastics that are used in packaging even down to the Stelvin closure device at the end of a bottle of wine, right? That's the <laughs> twist top, right? That my husband always corrects me on that. Stelvin closure device, whatever. But um, it's lined with plastic. Many of the foods that we get from grocery stores come in plastic and they seem to be something that is supposed to be heat safe that you could throw in your microwave, that dark black plastic. Um, and, you know, one of the things that you talk about in your book is the fact that each of these leaches chemicals into our bodies when we consume them. So I'd like for you to talk about specifically why from a health perspective, um, plastics are bad for us to consider as a packaging item for food as perhaps additional fodder for people to consider really trying to limit their exposure to them. Yeah, plastic is not benign from a health perspective. Numerous studies have shown that when you heat food or a liquid up in a plastic container, chemicals 
from the plastic leach into the food or beverage the, that can disrupt, disrupt your endocrine system, um, can lead to serious chronic illnesses down the line, including cancer. When I was researching the book, something I was shocked to learn was that if you buy a bottle of water and a plastic bottle and you leave it in your car <laughs> in the center console mm -hmm. and it's a hot day, even just a hot day will leach, the plastic bottle will leach chemicals into your water. I had always assumed it was microwave based or dishwasher based, but no. Mm -hmm. And some foods uh, are more susceptible to that leaching. Tomatoes are a big one. That's why there's the non-BPA can liners uh, that I am always looking for. Um, how do you identify those? Because I've even often looked at grocery stores and been like, well, I just want to shy away from anything tomato for that reason. Well, I would say number one, best practice would be grow your own tomatoes, can them all at home. But for listeners who aren't quite there yet, uh, I, in my experience, every canned product that has a non-BPA lining will say so in a gigantic font front and center. And that's mm -hmm. because marketers know that there is a significant subset of consumers who are looking for BPA free canned goods. Great. Now, <clears throat> another topic that came to mind is as I was reading your book in particular was how you get buy-in from your partner and your kids around trying to live a little bit more minimalistic or not getting that latest, greatest plastic toy that they might <laughs> want. Um, this is something we battle in our own house and um, has quite honestly led to me boycotting certain TV shows that are so heavily marketed towards plastic toys. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to just get your thoughts on that. And perhaps you could even just speak about your journey um, from that personal perspective, just going from being more consumerist to more minimalist and how you got their buy-in. So my children are, they just turned four and seven. Uh, so they're still young. And I am fortunate that I started this lifestyle <laughs> when my oldest, when my seven-year-old was a baby. So she really doesn't know much different. I have no idea how listeners with a 13 year old are going to pivot <laughs> to an eco bit of this lifestyle. I'm sorry, I, I just don't know. But I will say in my house, I do a few things that I think keep them bought in. The mm -hmm. first is uh, we prioritize experiences. So um, my daughter just had her birthday party, her like we give experiences her, she's going to have a cooking class with my grandmother. That was her main gift. Then that is in her opinion, the, the greatest thing, like one-on-one -on -one time with her beloved grandmother. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, she's sleeping over her other grandmother's house next weekend for a movie night. So prioritizing experiences and is one way in which I hope to continue to, um, highlight like the joy that others can bring to our lives and therefore diminish the, the oversized, the potentially oversized impact of a new toy. That's not to say they don't get new toys. They got toys mm -hmm. on their birthday, but we don't give a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think each of my daughters got three presents from us and um, same at Christmas. We are very strict. Each child gets between five and seven presents. It's a want, a need, a read, a share, an experience. So five. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really strict about that uh, because I've seen in my own life, yesterday, today's it toy is tomorrow's clutter. Um, there, And I also think as parents, it's our job to fight back against consumerist culture. Our children, our children, they don't have that insight. They don't um, have that perspective to be able to do it for themselves. And so I do believe as a mom, it, it, that is my job. I will say that my seven-year-old, she is starting the comparison game. She sees her friends have, I don't know, let's just use the example of an iPad. Her mm -hmm. friends have an iPad. She, she came home uh, one day, a couple of weeks ago, mom, why don't I have an iPad like my friend? And when she, when she asks questions like that, it's a very simple family motto that I use in this family. We do things differently. 
Uh, and then I follow that up with <laughs> all the great things. We do. Yeah. All the great things we do differently. Differently doesn't need to mean that we are curmudgeons and don't have any fun and don't ever buy stuff. <clears throat> it just means that we, we value other things. I hope that answers your question. No, I think it does. And, you know, I personally have a sense of overwhelm around the holidays when it comes to Christmas and the consumerism that surrounds it, the number of asks that my six-year-old has for toys that he wants. And, you know, I just always lean back on, you know, write it on a list. It doesn't mean you're getting all of it, but you'll get something, you know, just go ahead and, and keep that in his mind. Recently, um, this week, he asked for a specific helmet for a specific Star Wars character. And he said, can we just go buy it? And I said, no, we can't buy that, but we can make it. And so we created a project around it. We actually lo looked up a YouTube tutorial. Somebody had created it out of cardboard, um, paper, toilet paper rolls and paper mache, which are all non-toxic. And especially in today's culture with the number of items that people get shipped them, you know, guess what? You tend to have cardboard around, right? So it was a fun Sunday activity. It's probably going to take us three or four nights to finish because it's a rather complex helmet. <laughs> um, but it's just one thing, get him to engage in something that's different and honestly, family time around that. So it's one of the things that we're doing. Another is that, um, you know, you mentioned earlier participating in those um, Facebook groups that might be mommy, mommy, daddy, buy, sell, trade type of um, groups. And we participate in those. Um, I've said goodbye to anything Ryan's world. He's not allowed to watch that show anymore. <laughs> I don't even don't. know that show. <laughs> oh, it's um, the dangers of YouTube, you know, okay. so um, a lot of his friends know about it and they want to watch it. So um, we have to be real careful about what we'll allow in this day and age, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, screen time is a gift rather than, you know, something he automatically gets, things like that. Um, yep. Yeah. So as I look through your book too, an idea you share is moving towards this lifestyle can actually save you money. And especially now when many people are hurting, they aren't necessarily employed in the same way that they might've been in the past. They might have limited hours. They might've even lost their jobs. I would think that this is something that could resonate with the greater community and perhaps get buy-in from people who might be more reticent otherwise. So is there a quantifiable amount of money that you've been able to save on an annual basis or even just, um, you know, some practical idea of how much somebody might save that you could offer them? So I've never gotten out my spreadsheet to see <laughs> exactly how much money I've saved, but I can give you a really quick example um, of a big money saver. So in my town, we... Uh, the trash pickup, those are private entities. So we have to, each household chooses a trash company to stop at their house once a oh, week. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's not um, town-wide. So when we first moved to this house, we were having the trash come, trash man come every, trash man or woman, excuse me, come uh, every week. And as we continued to reduce our trash, reduce our recycling, uh, my husband and I said, you know, I think we could do every two weeks. Mm. And <laughs> so we called them up. They said, sure. So that was saving us $80 a year, just having it. And then mm -hmm. a little while after that, we said, I think we could have them come once a month. <laughs> wow! And now we are saving close to $300 a year, just having them come once a month. So that's just one example. Mm -hmm. I will also say that um, we are told that, you know, life is really hard. Um, we're real, we don't have a lot of time. And so we need X, Y, and Z product this convenient product to save time. However, what we don't realize is that we're actually paying a premium in terms of uh, a price. We're paying extra money for this convenient product. Mm -hmm. I, I could, I mean, the first example that comes to mind is disposable diapers, right? Mm -hmm. Those are 26 cents on average each. Uh, you go through, I don't know, 400 every 
let's just say, let's just say you use a hundred a month, right? Um, that is significantly more expensive than a cloth diaper. And I'm not advocating for everybody to go start cloth diaping, diapering their child, but I am suggesting that people start looking at this convenience factor. Like, mm -hmm. like is this product that you've been using for decades, is it worth that extra upfront cost? Sometimes I would say the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer might be no. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things you mentioned that I think is a really great tip in your book is the use of coconut oil for many of the things that you might use multiple products for otherwise. Um, so why don't we just use co coconut um, oil as an example? You know, what are the things that you use coconut oil for in your household and what products have they helped you replace? Yeah. So I use coconut oil as my face moisturizer, my body moisturizer, and my makeup remover. So one product, mm -hmm. <laughs> three, three uses. And then if you want to get crazy, I will say that coconut oil is in a lot of DIY home products. If you're into making your own lip balm, coconut oil is in there. Um, that's just an example, but uh, I am all about questioning whether I need these products to be more beautiful or to be more um, productive or whatever the product is. I'm always about questioning those claims mm -hmm. and seeing if I can simplify it. If I don't need the product, eliminate it or uh, use something else in multiple ways. Right. Now, I mean, I confronted that recently just with regard to this podcast. Um, you know, I learned about the Clubhouse app. I did a couple of two, of um, sessions through Clubhouse with another person's iPhone in my presence because it's not yet available on an Android. And I am an Android girl. This is my phone. I love it. Um, it's my Samsung S9. I've had it for three years. It's still kicking and doing really well. So in my mind, it's not time to be replaced. Even if there's some bigger, better, faster, more gadget available now, and even if Clubhouse was only available on Apple devices. Um, I made a conscious decision over 10 years ago to walk away from Apple because I felt like their products, generally speaking, had a planned obsolescence of only a year or two down the road. Like they just would push so many updates. It would take up so much space on the phone or on the device and it would just gradually stop working as well. Um, and I bit the bullet, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I got an iPad that was refurbished online from a reseller that would put a warranty on it. So it's a couple years old, but guess what? It runs iOS and it runs clubhouse. So now I have this iPad that's replacing my older son's tablet, which was, you know, on its last legs that he's, you know, had for about five years now. So I'm thinking about ways that you know, as I make these decisions in my life, how can I go ahead and fulfill the needs that I have around my scholastic work or around my, my work work or around the podcast work to try and just be a little bit more mindful in the day, in my daily life. So I apply that. Um, now you mentioned these DIY efforts that you feature in your book, and there are a lot of them. So I was hoping you could just give us the highlights from the type of DIY projects that you have in your book, because they seemed practical. They also were wide ranging in my opinion, and they seem relatively simple. So I was surprised by that. Like, so just talk for a moment. You have the floor. Well, I want to say that <laughs> I don't jump out the gate with uh, DIY recipes. I don't think that that's where somebody completely new to an eco-minimalist lifestyle should start. I think making stuff at home yourself is an advanced strategy after you've been at this a while. But yes, uh, DIY in 2021 has a bad reputation as being time consuming. Why make when you can buy, right? But um, the reality is that you can make home cleansers for, and you know, you can make a six month supply in under three minutes and save a lot of money. Uh, and you can put them in your own glass bottles instead of the plastic ones, which are probably going to the landfill. Mm -hmm. Same with a lot of beauty products. My absolute favorite beauty DIY beauty 
hack is I make my own uh, dry shampoo and I'm actually using some right now. <laughs> um, it's as simple as mixing some cornstarch in a jar. And if you have dark hair like I do, you add coconut powder until it matches the color of your hair. You put I it in a cocoa powder, right? Oh, what did <clears throat> I say? Coconut. Oh, you were talking about <laughs> coconut. Yes, right. you, I'll start. I'll <clears throat> say that again. You add a uh, cocoa powder until it matches the color of your hair. I use an old makeup brush, a, a, um, apply it to my roots, use my fingers, move it in. And there we go. That's, that's my dry shampoo for the day. Um, so easy. I mean, two ingredients, you put it in, in a jar and you mix it up. Shake it up, right? You just <laughs> literally, you don't even have to mix it. You probably just shake it, right? Yeah. And those are two things you probably already have in your cabinet. Um, so you could make it out of ingredients you already have, or you could go to the store and spend $5 on a, on a product and probably an aerosol container. It's a, in my opinion, it's a no win. I would absolutely yeah. make it. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Pardon me. You also, this got me to think about whether or not that could actually get you between, like if you happen to dye your hair between sessions of getting your hair dyed, like if you were going a little gray, you could use some of this dusted powder at your part line or something like that. I don't know. Cause I don't currently dye my hair, but the pandemic is giving me lots of grays. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's going to be soon. I'm, you know, give me another six months and I'll report back on <laughs> and if that works. <laughs> Yeah. Another thing that you mentioned, I think, um, was even eyeliner being relatively simple to make. And, um, that one was one that spoke to me. I was like, well, you know, I could make my own eyeliner. That's amazing. Yeah. And if I'm not sure if, um, you know, you have health concerns, but making stuff at home to go without saying is, is a great way to limit your exposure to potentially hazardous chemicals. So yeah, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, definitely cleaner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my go-to, uh, scrub for my pots and pans is some sea salt mixed with some lemon juice, make a paste and then put it in your disgusting, dirty pots and pans and scrub away. It works better than any product I've ever used on the market. So easy. Really? <clears throat> and that's just salt, salt and oil, sea salt and no lemon juice. Lemon juice. Did I say lemon oil? Sorry. If I, no. <laughs> I might've made that there. Um, I think, uh, you know, I've been looking at things that you can use for skin scrubs and things like that. I think you mentioned using, um, uh, sugar or salt along with an oil for a scrub for your face. Isn't it for example? Yeah. And another one that's all over the internet currently is using coffee grounds. So I know you like your coffee. I do like my yeah. coffee. Thankfully we <laughs> compost. So, you know, it all goes in the compost and I don't feel so guilty about that. Yeah. But I know it takes a lot of water to grow. Same <laughs> with you know, things like almonds. Um, I think uh, the statistic for almonds is a gallon of water per nut or something ridiculous. I, mean, I know it's a lot. Same with avocados. That's kind of our Achilles heel in this house. Um, yeah. Yeah. Farming agriculture uses a lot of water. Thankfully there is new technology coming out. Like there's more of a movement towards vertical farming where the water usage is much, much lower and they're um, able to grow produce like lettuces and microgreens indoors, um, not use pesticides because of the fact that they're not in open fields and um, create a cleaner product that utilizes less water, but those aren't necessarily really commercially available products yet. You know, we mm -hmm. still rely on open farming for most of our foods, right? Well, thank you, Stephanie, for all of your hard work in advancing the sustainable and minimalist perspective. I'd like to ask you just one last question, and that's if there's anything you would like to leave our listeners with, that 30,000 foot view, that soundbite or takeaway, just so that they can take that with them on their days. <laughs> what would you like here? Just give me like a, give me um, an example. <laughs> well, so... Um, you know, if you wanted to say, for instance, the one thing that you would have them change or the one thing that you might offer them as a piece of advice as they're continuing on their own paths towards sustainability or minimalism. Okay. So, yeah, I think I would like to just bring this conversation back to where we started, which is eco-friendliness does not have to be 
an all or nothing game. It does not have to be stressful. It does not have to be time consuming. Um, it's not only for the privileged eco-friendliness is for everyone because the planet's for everyone. So if you can find one little change that you'd be interested in making, uh, go for it and then reach out to me and let me know how it goes. And if it's going terribly, reach out to me so I can help you out. Yeah. Well, you do have that ongoing blog. Um, I know that you also have quite a bit of activity on Instagram. Um, so people can reach out to you with DMs and connect with you with their ideas or thoughts or questions as well. Right. I love it. I love hearing from people all over the globe. So please do. It might take me a little while <laughs> to get back to you, but I get back to everybody. So I'd love to hear from your listeners. I love that. Now, I know I will take some of the practical learnings from your book into my daily life. I already shop for wine that comes with corks as a, for example. Um, and I just want to personally thank you for helping me on my minimalist journey. I'm going to try and let go a little bit more of the things I might have been holding on to that I'm not using that are staring me in the face. And I'm looking at a couple in my office right now. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Corinna. This was an awful lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Oh, just thank you. Now I like to invite our listeners to act. Um, that action could be as simple as sharing this podcast with people in your community, refusing that plastic bag at the grocery store and putting everything directly in your cart or choosing products that are more mindful of the packaging they're in. You could even choose one or two items that you might choose to start making yourself at home as opposed to buying in some big plastic jug from the grocery store. You could even just order a zero waste electronic or audio copy of sustainable minimalism like I did. In writing this book, Stephanie gives you a gift of more life experience while reducing waste, saving you time and money. To find suggestions like this, visit our action page on caremorebebetter.com. There you'll find causes and companies we encourage you to support. Join the conversation and be a part of the community we're building. You can follow us on social spaces at Care More Be Better and on Clubhouse at Care More Be Better without that final E and better. Now you can send us a DM on any platform or an email to hello at caremorebebetter.com. Thank you listeners now and always for being a part of this pod and this community because together we can do so much more.